All right, let's get right into this thing. There's a lot of stuff we got to cover today. First thing on a 6G test is prep, clean the inside and outside. I'm just cleaning the inside right now, though, for the sake of time. I'm gapping this thing with a 532 stick rod, and I'm going to use 332 filler. There's a lot of options there. That's what I'm doing today. Now, there will be requirements on how many tacks you can have. Usually it's four at 12, 3, 6, and 9. There are usually requirements about how long the tacks can be because there's just not much weld here. So if you make a inch long tack, there's hardly any weld between the tacks. So probably about a quarter inch or less is about right. And I'm just making, just taking a stab at it here. Something between a quarter and an eighth of an inch maybe. Now I, I am using a, a machine with a foot pedal here today. That, that's probably not the best idea for practice on this. Just for the sake of the video, making it easy, that's the one I had hooked up. You're probably going to be using an air-cooled scratch start rig. And so if you don't know how to hook one of those up, I've got a video on scratch start TIG and how to hook it up, as well as some more information on putting a root pass in. I'll link it up right here. I'm putting another tack here after I wedged it apart to make sure I keep my 532 gap. This tack is 180 degrees away from the first one. I'm trying to get full penetration and not sink them in there too much. You know, if you blob in there with too hot of a tack, it's kind of hard to overcome that. So I'm trying to put my tacks in there about what I think I can push in there on 6 o'clock on the route as well. Oftentimes there will be a WPS for you to read, a welding procedure specification. If there is, read it thoroughly and follow it. It'll tell you how many tacks, how long they should be, whether or not you need to feather them, and whether or not you're even allowed to use a grinder. You may have to just ask about some of these things. I've taken tests when the only thing available was a file, and that's pretty common. They don't want, they don't want it to be a grinding test. They want it to be a welding test. Now, that's a TIG finger. That's my product. I highly recommend it for this type of test. This thing can get pretty smoking hot after you get that root in there and for the hot pass and even while you're welding the root sometimes you know it just depends you could easily do it without if you if you prop down far enough but this thing moves along smoothly on the on the pipe that's a, that's as much benefit as the heat protection on something like this so I'm taking lots of dry runs here I want this 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 to feel really comfortable once I get started I don't want to get hung up on anything so I start off on that six o'clock tack I don't want to hang out there too long, get that edge melted, and I'm pushing a little bit of rod in there each time I dip. And I'm trying not to put a very big keyhole, and I'm trying not to go too wide because I'm not going to be able to push reinforcement in there on the bottom if I do. I'm fighting gravity here. Now, a lot of guys would back feed this joint, and um, I just never got into back feeding because every test I've ever taken like this limited me to a 1 8 gap plus or minus a 30 second so 532 would be the max and I've just learned to do it this way push a little in there so I just tie into the root and I keep adding rod as I go I keep almost going to save the same speed and motion go right over that small tack and just keyhole and keep going this is just one way to do it it works pretty good for me or it used to anyway back when I did this for a living it's been a while we'll get a look at this thing at the end and see if it's acceptable but Again, I'm, I'm, every time I come out, I'm checking to make sure I fuse into those walls. Get a, a slight keyhole going. Nothing big. On the top, I'm adding a little less rod than I did on the bottom. Gravity's going to take care of it there. You're fighting gravity on the bottom by not going very wide and adding a lot of rod. And then on the top, you can kind of compensate by going just a little bit wider and adding a little bit less rod. All right, left hand here, we'll do the left side. Now, this is something that takes a little bit of practice. Not everybody feels comfortable with this. In fact, I don't anymore. I used to feel pretty darn comfortable with my left hand. You know, I, I got out of the pipe fitting, pipe welding industry a lot of years ago. I keep my hand in it just a little bit. Just, just actually, the only time I weld pipe is when I do videos. So, every few years. I guess I got to correct that. I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to start practicing more on pipe to, uh, you know, know what the heck I'm talking about. But after a little bit of a few dry runs, all of a sudden it doesn't feel so awkward. Everything tends to move just a little bit slower when you swap hands if you don't feel completely comfortable with your non-dominant hand. But basically, it's the same exact thing, the same exact technique. 
In just a minute, I'll show another way to hold a torch if you can't do it left-handed, and I'll also show a clip from a previous video of using the lay wire technique with just using a 1 8 gap and a 1 8 rod. You could also, you could absolutely do that on this particular test. I kind of prefer the, uh, the dip keyhole because it moves a little slower, and it's easier to reposition your body getting around this diameter pipe. All right, let's take a look at that now, how to hold it, how to hold the torch and, and go up the left side your, or your non-dominant side. And you, you really would like to use your left hand or your, or your non-dominant hand, but that doesn't work for you. So normally I, would, I was doing this side with my left hand. Now I'll just do it with my right, and I'll prop just like this. And I can go a good ways like that, at least up to 9 o'clock, and then I could reposition and get over top of the pipe and, and finish it out. But this definitely gets me from bottom to to the uh, the side there no problem so that looks something like this this particular this is a previous video this particular clip it's a it's a um, a 309 filler wire test so I've got a purge going on on this and you'll notice the puddle looks a little different a little cleaner and it does it is cleaner because I've got it purged and because it's stainless filler wire but it's the same technique I push a little rod in there each time a little bit more on the bottom than on the top. I'm trying to feed the rod up in there a little bit and not out on the face of the puddle. Just push a little in there and nice and easy does it. And when you get to the top, you add just a little bit less than you would on the bottom. Now that, that provided a fairly even route with some reinforcement all the way around there. No matter where you go test, I would highly recommend just ask a few questions. Ask them how much reinforcement they want on the root pass because it's different everywhere you go. All right, this is the outside of the root pass. I just welded on that monster coupon. And let's look at the inside real quick. I got a little overzealous on pushing, pushing through on the bottom. And it's a little uneven in places, so it's not exactly a wedding band, but I'll get better with more practice. It doesn't really matter too much what it looks like on the outside. All right, let's show the lay wire here. This is a six inch coupon I did a few years ago using the lay wire technique, freehand with a TIG finger, 1 8 gap, 1 8 rod, 37 and a half degree bevels. And I just moved the electrode forward and back with no side by side movement. And that usually does a really good job. There was a job I worked on that pretty much insisted you put the root passes in that way. All right, what are the three main objectives of the hot pass? Achieve good fusion, you don't want any voids. Add more metal to protect the root for the stick welding or the, or the for, uh, future TIG passes and don't screw up the root that you just put in there. Those are really the main three objectives. So you might want to let it cool before you start the hot pass. Let it cool down a bit. If it's too hot, you're going to be more likely to suck back probably. Hot pass isn't always hotter than the root. It just depends on how thick the root you put in and, and what size rod you're using for the hot pass and all that. This is a 1 8 rod. I probably should have the rod up toward the top of the puddle, but camera was in the way. I'm going to use that as an excuse. But it's just a lay wire root at about 125 amps. In this case, I used uh, you know probably around 90 to 100 for the root, and then I turned it up a little bit because I packed a good bit of metal in there on the root. So it just seemed to take it. So for part two, and we're gonna, I'm going to break this into two videos, the stick portion, 7018332, I'm going to be working with Kyle Lockwood of Georgia Trade School. Uh, he, he did the route also on, on a coupon, but I just couldn't get any shots. Just everything seemed to be in the way that day. So right now for the rest of the video, I'm going to talk to a young lady named Sydney who is over recruitment and job placement here at Georgia Trade School. She used to work in a job that recruited thousands of welders, and so she's got something to say about weld testing and about tips for getting hired. <laughs> yeah, so along, along with the tips and techniques and tricks and fundamentals that you need to know to pass a, a welding test, there are some other things that are very helpful to know. And I want to talk to Sydney here with Georgia Trade School. This is Sydney. Hey. We've, hi. <laughs> We've had her, we interviewed her at length on the Welding Tips and Tricks podcast. And I thought it was a great interview, by the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and on that podcast, we talked about things like showing up on time, work ethic, what you want to do on when you're going to take a welding test. We talked about all kinds of things. That link will be in the description of this YouTube video as well as on my web page where this video will reside. All right, what are some of the things that somebody wants to make sure they do when they go when they show up for a welding test? You know, these are not necessarily things like like uh, be practiced up and all that stuff, but there's there's some soft skills, there's some attitude things and and 
anyway, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I don't want to lead you into this, yeah, but yeah, I know absolutely. you have experience with I this do. because, because Sydney worked previously prior to being with George, with Georgia trade school. She was a recruiter for one of the largest shipbuilding companies in the world, which was Ingle Shipbuilding. Okay. So shipyards probably hire more welders than almost any single industry. A lot. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's there's she's got a lot of experience with people coming through testing, recruiting people to come and test. So mm -hmm. that's enough of me talking. What can somebody, <laughs> what can somebody do to really increase their chances of passing a welding test? Well, so much of welding can be mental. It's a, sometimes it's a mental game. And so one tip that I always tell the students and I try to tell anybody that, that we've tested previously is to change your mindset and think about the person on the other side of the table or the other person testing you wants to hire you instead of looking for a reason not to hire you. And sometimes just understanding that that person's not trying to disqualify you, they're trying to hire you, mm -hmm. can be all the difference in the world to help your confidence going into a test. Because with the Naval Shipbuilder, their, their standards are so high and it can be really intimidating uh, and we saw that a lot. Um, so if changing your mindset to understand that people are looking for a reason to hire you, not to not hire you. Sometimes that mental, like just flip side on, you know, a, understanding what they're going through can make a difference walking in the door. And a lot of times that can change their attitude and then of course confidence comes into play. So a lot of times it turns out better and I tell students that, I don't think they really believe me <laughs> until they get there, but having that mindset can make a difference. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, they already think you can do the job, that's why you're there to test. Mm -hmm. So understanding they already think that you're a qualified individual or otherwise they wouldn't be wasting the time. But they have, it's expensive to hire people. It's expensive to lay off people. They're trying to cut those costs as mm -hmm. quick as possible. So they're bringing you in because they think you're qualified. So don't mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> don't do anything yeah. stupid. Like, don't be rude to the receptionist. Don't be rude to the person calling to interview you. I've had that happen to me hundreds of times where I called somebody and, you know, just to set them up with an interview and, you know, yeah, okay, whatever, I'll be there. And, you know, that that's pretty, that's a pretty easy way for me to turn around and tell the, Tell the hiring manager, you know, hey, let's see, what's up. this guy was rude to me. Well, I don't want to hire him. Just call him back, tell him we don't want to test him. It's that easy, you know. And he had no idea on the other end of the line. No, right? uh -uh. but there, you get hiring managers get to be in good, you know, you have good working relationships and rapport with people, and, and sometimes it seems like a menial task, but that's really that's a very yeah. important step, and you can mess yourself up before you ever get in the door. Just. That person behind the desk when you sign in may have had just the worst morning ever. I mean, you know, in life, in life, people are generally going through things that you have no idea about. And so if they're, you know, you just, just be nice. That's, mm -hmm. that's part of the equation. Treat people like you want to be treated. Yeah. Let's go to the flip side of that question. Uh, mm -hmm. That was kind of a pie. What can you do? Mm -hmm. And we sort of dealt with the negative, but let's, let's talk about the kind of things that you can really shoot yourself in the foot. You kind of alluded to that already. Yeah, I think attitude sometimes makes or breaks it. If he, if he brought you, a, you know, if you turn your test plate in and he's like, man, that's that's not good enough, slinging your test plate down, cussing, acting a fool, yeah, I mean, sometimes that guy is willing to give you another chance or he's willing to kind of like turn a blind eye and let you fix something. Sometimes that could be the case. And mm -hmm. I've seen that happen. Um, <laughs> don't cry. <laughs> sounds silly but I have seen that too guys cry hoping to get the sympathy it's like take the criticism don't mm -hmm. don't judge the person that's telling you you know this isn't good enough or it's you know it's too much undercut or whatever like take take yep. the criticism as a grown man or woman and say thanks I appreciate the feedback you know see you next time yeah that that can be a, a big deal something just occurred to me that you, uh, anybody could ask, and it wouldn't hurt anything to ask, and it would be professional to just ask this question if you get failed on the visual on a test. So are there any provisions for me to retest, or are there mm -hmm. any provisions for me to repair that and make it okay? Right. Uh, you know, what can I do? Can I come back? You know, this this year you're still in front of you're still like a live uh you know you, there, there's still a spark there yeah so if you can you know can i reschedule for mm -hmm. another test right how long do i have to wait can i get your number right. you know yeah what do you think i, I need work on or burn, where am I don't failing? burn any bridges right, right. yeah i've seen <laughs> unfortunately we've you've probably all seen it especially at, at the the high concentration rate that that shipyards go through mm -hmm. with welders i mean you see people that get mad like you don't know what you're doing throw a plate down. I mean, it just gets, the list goes yeah. on and on and they're rude to everybody walking out the door. 
Yeah. That can, that's a, that's a horrible reputation to develop. And don't think that we don't take notes in HR. <laughs> Don't think that we don't remember those types of things mm -hmm. or the testers don't remember those types of things. They do. They remember, they remember the bad ones way more than they remember the good ones. These things will help you as much as the fundamentals uh, on passing a welding test. Get a good night's sleep. Don't drink too much coffee or energy drinks in the morning where you're shaky. You <laughs> know, it's chance. hard. I never got a good night's sleep. I tried. Right. Every night before a welding test, I didn't sleep good. Mm -hmm. You just know, you know you're going to be under the gun. Mm -hmm. But anyway, question number two. Okay. All right. You had quite a bit of experience recruiting for shipyards. Mm -hmm. Why would a young man or woman uh, fresh getting out of welding school, maybe they've got a certification under their belt or maybe they're ready to go take a certification. Okay. Why would they consider a shipyard as a way to build their skills, get experience, build their chops? You know, what would you, what's your, your take on that? Well, I think shipyards, in particular, Ingle Shipbuilding, their, their standards are higher um, than, than normal places, right? Than Trinity or some of these other, like railroad cars or... Mm -hmm. So when you're working with somebody who consistently has high expectations, your work ethic and your skill level naturally rises to that or you wouldn't be there. That's so true. So going to another company will feel like a breeze. <laughs> when you're um, just naval standards are, are really high, of course nuclear is the highest, but mm -hmm. I think they're right up under nuclear. So working at that level, anywhere else you go is gonna be cake. Yeah. You know, I mean that's easy. And then of course there's the idea of, of being involved in something um, at Ingalls the pride of working on a on a destroyer is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, that's always neat. Those things go in history books, so that's cool. Um, but mainly the education opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. You get a ton of material that you get to work on, and the variety of stuff and processes that they have uh, there that are required for those ships per the Navy is easy to um, it's easy to get on that part of the ship, and you don't have that certification. So what do they do? They send you to the training center. You certify, you come back. That's totally free. Mm -hmm. You would pay hundreds of dollars would. and sometimes more than that to get those same certifications that they're giving you for free. That's that's free experience that you can take with you anywhere. So. Yeah, we talked earlier about this uh, when we took another stab at this interview and had too much background noise, but <laughs> we talked about uh, things like, the perfect example is copper nickel yeah. piping mm -hmm. because if it's corrosion resistance to seawater, right. you're not gonna see that everywhere. Mm -mm. I have never seen it. I've been on. I've been on five nuclear jobs in a 40 year career and I've never had the opportunity to weld copper nickel. That's neat. But yeah. you get it on yeah. a shipyard. And, and the other thing about a shipyard is it's basically everything that would be in a power plant, a paper mill, or a nuclear plant, except it's in tighter quarters. It's a floating city with yeah. a, <laughs> a floating uh, plant, I guess, yeah. and city. Yeah. And uh, you, you will, if you can make those x ray welds in those tight quarters on things like copper nickel, stainless ink and L, you can certainly do it on any job. Correct. So, you know, it's, it's an option. It may not be. It may not be for everybody. Right. It's good, hard, honest work, though. We always, I mean, we expect that. Shipyards expect that. We know that somebody may not be there for forever. That mm -hmm. can be harsh. I mean, getting up early, long hours, the weather. I mean, there's a lot of things mm -hmm. that are involved in it. It may not be for everybody, but just the education benefits alone to me with a large company, especially one that has naval standards, mm -hmm. is, is exponentially beneficial. I think anybody can take a lot of, um, a lot of understanding about how big companies work, uh, how big projects are conducted, and your part and role in that, the education piece, um, and just the skill level expectation. If that's your starting out, like that's what you expect the rest of the industry to be, like you're set. You know, if you yeah. can keep that mindset that that's how, yep. that's what my skill level should be everywhere I go, I think every job after that will, will come easier and easier instead of starting off easy and increasing mm -hmm. your expectations. Okay. So always a, always a pleasure, yeah, Sydney, thank you. pleasure thank talking you. to you. Once again, the, the link to the podcast where we interviewed Sydney for what, an hour or more? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty we stayed up pretty late. <laughs> we were. <laughs> is, it will be in the, in the description of this YouTube video as well as on the website. And if you want to hear details about shipyard life and, and testing and stuff, you can go listen to that. Mm -hmm. But thanks for letting me uh, ask these questions, yeah, Sydney. I, I really appreciate it. the information. I think yeah. this is going to be very helpful. Help, I think the, I think, <laughs> I think this is going to be very helpful for, for anybody going yeah. to take a, a 6G test or a plate, any test. Any test, yeah. yeah. This is, that's, that's the goal, is to help. I remember when I was a young man, between jobs, two little small boys, mm -hmm. no paycheck, Stressful. going to take this test meant the world to right. me. And, and it was pressure. 
Mm -hmm. And anything I can do to help that young man or woman out there put food on the table, right? You know, that's what we want to do. Absolutely. So, thanks so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Okay, in part two, I'll be working with Kyle Lockwood, instructor at Georgia Trade School, and we're going to be showing body positioning, ways to hold the stinger, ways to get the right rod angle, you know, his way of doing it, my way of doing it, to anything we can think of to help and kind of give you a leg up on passing this kind of 6G, a monster coupon or any other 6G. This one's just got a whole lot more beads in it, sort of an endurance test, but stay tuned for that video. Uh, thanks to Georgia Trade School for having me out. Thanks to Kyle for working with me. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Sydney. I'll put links to Georgia Trade School, how to get in touch with English Shipbuilding, that episode of the podcast where he interviewed Sydney in the description of this video. Just as a reminder, I support these videos with my online store at weldmonger.com. Thanks so much for watching.